Welcome everybody to the 13th episode of the Struggling Scientist podcast. This is a podcast by scientists, for scientists, anyone science adjacent and perhaps even hobbyist. My name is Susanna and I'm here with my co-host Jerome. Hi. Now today we're continuing with our three-part series about tips for future PhD students. Um, last time we talked about the PhD, is it a good idea? And today we're going to talk about finding a PhD spot that works for you and all the things that you need to consider um, when looking for a spot. And then next time we'll talk about tips for the application process. So let's start. Now important to keep in mind is that we are PhDers in the Netherlands, in Europe, um, and that The process of finding a PhD spot can be very different between different countries. So please always uh, ask around and look up how it works in the country that you are interested in. But most of our tips will definitely work for every every country. Since a PhD is a PhD, of course. Today, the second part is about finding a PhD spot that works for you. Now, Again, we would really like to uh, thank all our listeners and our Twitter fans for sending all their tips and also our colleagues who had some great suggestions and tips for future PhD students that really helped us make this episode. Now, if you're interested in having the complete list of tips, please check out our brand new websites because we will from now on be putting blog posts there that fit with every episode. Um, and there you can see a really nice overview of all the tips that we got and that we're also discussing in this three-part series of the episode. So check our website, thestrugglingscientist.com. So last time we discussed all the tips for if a PhD is actually good for you, and if it's the thing you want to do. Um, And then we sort of get to the second part, where um, you actually have decided that you want to do a PhD, and then you have to find a spot that works for you, of course. And then first off, you need to think about what you want. Because not all PhDs are the same and knowing what you want or what you need can be really important to find a spot that works for you. So first of all, the topic, of course, and this is, of course, something that everybody thinks about. Uh, What do you find interesting? Try to explore some topics, maybe explore some things that you don't know. Definitely take your internship seriously and try to take as much knowledge from that as possible also about what kind of supervision you need um, but we'll definitely explain more about that in our episode about tips for students and how to make the most of your internships um, and narrow down your topic a bit but not too much because in my opinion <laughs> everything is interesting and in the end you want a project that you can sort of make your own and there's still a lot of depending on the project, of course, some freedom to make the project your own and go into a direction that you like. Uh, and if you narrow down too much, you you also limit the amount of positions that you can apply for. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you look at everything we just discussed of what you need to take into account, and if you know you want to do something in only one specific topic where there's only one specific group doing it, maybe, then you need to kind of get lucky that everything lines up perfectly with that group. Yes. Which is hard, of course. Uh, and another really big tip is to speak to a number of current or past PhD students and maybe supervisors, potential supervisors or su- uh, professors that you know about the whole process and about all the possibilities and sort of help you narrow down what you want. Because people are generally very, very willing to help and uh, don't definitely don't feel awkward about reaching out. And um, on Twitter, there's also a very nice community of people willing to offer specific advice to upcoming PhD students. So you can always reach out to them. And of course, you can always reach out to us. Just email us or contact us on our website if you have specific questions and you want our advice. Um, It might help, for example, if you are in the US to specifically ask somebody in the US or if you want to go to, I don't know, England to do a PhD to ask people in England to um, uh, about advice about what doing a PhD there is like. and that can really give you a lot of information that um, you might not have before. Yes. So in addition to those, uh, you also need to figure out if you want to go abroad or not for your PhD. Of course, going abroad sounds very cool. You get to explore a new city and everything. But you do lose your support system, at least seeing them physically every day. 
And yeah, can you handle that? Are you ready for that? Yeah, you will need to make new friends and explore this new situation, get a new house. That's a, that's a lot to handle on top of your PhD. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an adventure. It can be super fun, uh, but it's, again, not for everybody. And that, I guess, I guess, sort of relates back to getting to know yourself. What do you think will work for you? Decide if you, if you want to do a PhD abroad or in the country that you're at. Um, you can always go for your postdoc abroad. Um, then you might have a bit more experience. It's also a possibility. Um, yeah, and yeah, and the postdoc is often also sh- uh, shorter than the PhD duration, right? So it's also, if you don't like it, um, takes less time. True. So you yes. can always come back. You know. um, and then you want to already think about what your work-life boundaries what you want them to be because setting them early in a PhD uh, make sure that everybody knows to expect and um, it can also really matter where you apply uh, and what kind of work-life balances there are in that country for example in the United States it's very different to do a PhD than here in the Netherlands because in the Netherlands it's your only job basically and you get paid for it in the United States you also you don't get paid usually and you also need to work next to it and then those things really matter um, and in your work-life boundaries, are you willing to give your phone number to a PI or do you really not want him texting you in the weekend? For some people, that's fine. For other people, it's not. It also depends on the type of PI you have. Is he very nice? Is he is he fun to hang out with on drinks? Or would you rather not have him in drinks? This is, of course, a lot to think about and also uh, perhaps a bit difficult when you have zero experience with actually doing a PhD and what kind of PI you want. But it's all sort of part of the process of figuring out what you need and what you want and what kind of things you would be okay with and what things you would not be okay with. Because if you, for example, hear during a talk with a PhD student that a PI often emails or texts or whatever in the weekend, you never get any rest and you already know that that's not going to work for you because you have thought about this, you really should see this as a red flag and take it seriously. Yes, definitely. So in addition to that, this is one of the um, tips that we got from someone on Twitter. Uh, I assume they are doing their PhD in the US based on how specifically they uh, re- mentioned it. So th- their tip is be cognizant of the fact that the average time to graduate for a STEM uh, research project or PhD is 5.5 years, at least according to the NIH. And having any expectation that it would only take you four years is pretty much a dream. Uh, so prepare for the greatest challenge of your life. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that also accounts for everywhere around the world. I yeah. think uh, you will have, of course, people that do PhDs in three years. Often they're a bit more clinical. They're more patient related. But if you're in our work field, four years is definitely you're not getting your diploma at the end of four years. It's definitely going to take a lot longer than that. And um, make sure that you have considered this and that you know about this. Yeah, indeed. Uh, But I would say, though, at least I know the statistic for graduating from a PhD for our university, and that's like 5.2 years on average, right? So that Mm. you defend your PhD and get the title and everything. So it's, it's, again, not realistic, not only in the US, but also... Not in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't really think anywhere. And of course, you always have these outliers that do manage to do it in four years or less. But that's what they are. Outliers that prove the rule. Yeah, And also make sure that if you're thinking about these things, that you actually look up sort of in your field, how long PhDs normally take. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're looking for one and you see that there's only three years of funding, for example, or you need to completely get your funding or you get one year and then you need to write grants keep that in mind sort of that you know that there will be um a a problem where you need to get your own funding because three years probably not going to cut it and then you will probably have to write funding for the fourth year for example yeah and as we at least imagine or slash no uh getting funding can be quite difficult Yes, and it definitely doesn't always work. No, exactly. There's only a limited amount of funding and everyone is vying for it. So, yeah, it's difficult. Yes. Okay, then the next big tip is find out in the country that you have decided that you're interested in for looking, what is required for getting a PhD? Because this differs a lot per country. In some country, it's more like doing a study and you still can go to class. 
Uh, and in other countries, it's really more like a job, like it is for us. A really hard job, but more like a job because you still get paid uh, a bit. And um, you don't really, you're not a university student anymore. You're not, you're not a student. Mm. Um, so that differs a lot in different countries. And it also differs, for example, for how you work. Because in some countries, you don't actually need any papers to be published. And you work more as a first author. And you work w- more with a postdoc. And that's the structure you work in, or you do need a certain amount of papers. It can differ a lot. Um, so make sure that you have looked this up before even starting to apply to anything um, so that you know what you're in for. Yeah. And I think uh, that segues nicely into the next uh, tip that we have is to find out where not you find out what you get paid, if you do get paid or what you don't actually get paid in the country that you're looking to apply for a PhD and does that actually work for you and for your life goals for the next upcoming years because of course if you don't get paid and you're in abroad that also makes it difficult yes if you want to have a house and kids by the time you're 29 that's going to be difficult if you don't get paid yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) just just not getting paid or, or the system that it's like in other countries can work definitely there's a lot of people doing it um but it's not easy it's not easy and you just need to make sure that it lines up with your life goals also yeah i definitely could not imagine doing the the phd with potential kids abroad with no money that's that's expert level right there that yes you must really want the hardest of the hard at that point yes um And on top of that, also find out what kind of teaching responsibilities you have included in your different position. Is there anything expected for you? Um, Do you just get students or do you actually need to teach classes? Or do you, what is, what is included in different positions? What do different departments do that can, that can differ a lot per position? Um, And if you don't like teaching, make sure you steer clear from positions with a lot of teaching. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now you have uh, thought about all these things and you're ready to start looking for the specific positions uh, that you want. It's really important that you actually do research about the different positions and and take it quite seriously. Um, And first of all, of course, you have now decided on sort of your topic range that you like, um, but your supervisor and fit with the group and fit with your supervisor are actually almost more important than the topic because those are the people that you're going to work with for the next few years. And if they don't work for you, then that's going to be a real problem. And that's, again, something that you need to think about. Like, what do you need? Because a supervisor can be great with one person, but with another person, if it doesn't match, it can be absolutely horrible and you're going to be depressed. Um, So think about what kind of person you are and what kind of supervision you need. But also consider if you work best in a collaborative environment or if you want more competition or if you would like uh, a lot of control over your direction and your project or the, do you want it the other way around and have more support and management etc and have a more clearly defined uh, project all of this can happen uh, depending on what your style your pi likes for example in our case it's called a pi where in other cases some people call it supervisors right yeah i see a lot of us people calling it supervisors so. indeed yes so it really depends on if your two styles match. And it's not only bad for you if it doesn't match, it's also bad for the, for the supervisor because no supervisor is, of course, in it to do you harm or whatever. But um, professors are definitely not selected on management skills. There's nowhere in their process of becoming a professor where anybody looks at how good they will be at managing a group and managing people. So they actually have to somehow learn while they go how to do this. And this can be super difficult sometimes. Um, So often it is going to be up to you to ask for what you need directly and make sure uh, that they know. So you really want a supervisor that you can talk to and communicate this with. Mm. So you might be thinking that you're applying to a project, but you're also trying to find a supervisor that or a PI that really works well with you. Um, and a group that works well with you and that's really in the long run of the PhD going to be a thing that's either going to make you happy or super unhappy and this is honestly the thing that I've seen go wrong wrong most 
Yeah. I think. I think this is one of the most important tips that we have to give. Mm -hmm. Really, really choose your supervisor carefully. And we have some tips later on on how you actually can do that and how you can find on the found find out more during the application uh, process. Yeah. But maybe to come back to the management skills a little bit and whether or not PIs or supervisors get that. I do think they can get some training on that. I think some do. I think a lot a lot of them do, but only after they have become professors and have run into some trouble with it. Yeah, that they because, think, okay, maybe I need this. Yes, exactly. So, so, I mean, you are selected as a professor because you have done great research and you have written great paper, but that doesn't mean you have people skills. No, exactly. That's like, like you're, completely separate. And Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Your, your ability to manage people is, has been probably limited to... Uh, I managed a couple of students sometimes. And you didn't even have to be good at it. No, exactly. Because there's nobody looking at how good grades you were with your students. No, indeed. That's just not a selection criteria for a PI. And it, it, I guess it should be, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it but would I be cannot... a good thing for PhD students if that was actually one of the selection criteria. No, indeed. Uh, but I do know a lot of PIs try to get better it, at it. It's something they... They even discuss with each other, like how how to help this PhD student, but often they just don't know. So just be also aware of this. Don't take it too harshly if your PI is bad at it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, you can't be good at everything, I guess. Yeah, and in the end, we're all just awkward scientists, yeah. I guess. I mean, everyone's human. We all make mistakes. We all... Yes. We're all not good at everything, so, uh, I mean... Yeah. And I personally really like the crazy scientist type, so... Oh, yeah. But just know what works for you. Do you want a, a supervisor who is really on top of you and keep track of what you're doing, or do you want a, a supervisor that's more laid back and that you'll meet with, up with once a month, or, like, do you want a supervisor that's away most of the time, or do you want a supervisor that's always there when you have a question? What do you want? Yeah. What works for you? Because that's very different per person, and there's no right and wrong, but there's definitely wrong combinations of supervisor and PhD students. And I mean, even if you do select the uh, supervisor based on what worked for you, it could be like circumstances just change, right? True. Maybe the PI you're decides never, to leave. You're never 100% guaranteed. Yeah, exactly. Circumstances can just change and y you don't know what will happen, but you can try to make the best decision with the information that you have. At yes, the time. and I have a couple of friends that, that didn't end up with the, in the end of the PhD, had a different PI than they had in the beginning of the PhD or the different su the supervisor. And that sort of things also happen. So you, you are never guaranteed, but at least sort of know what you want so that you can also communicate this with a supervisor that if you really don't like them being on top of you, that you can communicate that this drives you crazy. and be okay with communicating this to, to a PI or supervisor. Yes. Um, and then one of the things to do this during your um, um, application process or when you're still looking, I guess, for, a, for a, a position is if you see an interesting position, also research the supervisor a bit. Find out how many PhDs he already had is, is he just new at like having PhD student or does he already have some experience with this um, just so you know what you're getting yourself into see I guess. if they maybe already looked up those management courses or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes um, yeah be careful with projects with too many PIs uh, you don't want to have too many captains on one ship that can cause a lot of problems <laughs> yes <laughs> But do make sure that you have people to fall back on when things go south. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would say also learn to recognize each of their strengths and weaknesses and see which one you can use for which problem, depending on the problem that you have, who it might be the best one to turn to to help you solve that problem or, you know. Yeah. And of course, multi having multiple PIs means that you can have experience from different research topics and bring them all together. Um, and that brings us back uh, sort of to a next uh, topic um, that you need to make sure that whatever PI you choose that they have some experience in your research topic because having to figure out an entire branch of research in your group is a lot of pressure to put on a PhD student and that's going to be difficult so that's not necessarily what you want yes okay and then the last one in this category is uh, find out what the institute that this position is at offers for PhD students. For example, 
in the Netherlands, you don't go to a university anymore because you already have a master, so there's no classes for you anymore. But then the institute for, uh, might offer some classes and uh, allow you to experience that a bit. And for example, get better in, in different skills. and Just for um, free. For free, yes. Uh, but different institutes might not have that, so try to figure out what is offered. Yes. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the second part of our three-part series about tips for future PhD students. Uh, please check out also our next episode that will be about tips for the application process. Now, if you're interested in getting the complete list, please check out our website, thestrugglingscientist.com, or if you have questions or comments or tips, um, you can also get in touch with us either via our website or via our social media. We have Twitter, we have LinkedIn, we have Facebook. So you can reach out to us in whatever way works for you. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.